answer to this question. When you look up in the sky at night and see trillions of stars, how many of them are from inside our own galaxy, and how many of them are from other galaxies? The answer is, all of them are from this galaxy alone. All other galaxies appear as but a speck in the distant cosmos of space. Nuclear physicist Michio Kaku refers to a classification system for alien civilizations based on a Type 0, Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3 graduation scale, 3 being the most advanced. This would be a civilization with intergalactic capabilities. This means they have the technology to travel to other galaxies. A Type 2 civilization is one that has mastered interstellar space travel. This type can leave their home star and begin colonizing other stars within their own galaxy. The Empire from Star Wars is not a Type 3, as Michio Kaku claims. It is actually an Orwellian Type 2, but we'll get back to that later. A Type 1 civilization has mastered interplanetary space travel and control of the Earth itself. Type 1 is able to sustain a habitable environment on Earth and in space. Type 1 has switched to clean, renewable energy, while Type 0 still relies on fossil fuels for energy and transportation. Here on planet Earth, we will remain Type 0 as long as we rely on hydrocarbon fossil fuels for our way of life. Before I can even begin to talk about all the really cool stuff that would exist in a Type 2 or Type 3 civilization, we have to concentrate on how to make the most crucial and difficult step of all, from Type 0 to Type 1. In physics, every single thing in the universe, including people, do only two basic things. They move and they interact. Physics is the study of energy and motion. Motion is half of physics which makes it half of everything that anything physical ever does. Transportation is half of what people do. They go places, and the technological capabilities of our transportation systems themselves is half of what defines us on the scale of civilizations. The other half is energy and information capabilities. The Internet is a Type 1 information system, which has a telephone and library built into one. The Internet is our first step towards this rather difficult graduation from being a Type 0 to being a Type 1. In the galactic neighborhood, it means the difference from being a complete zero to actually being someone. Type 0 global transportation systems rely on passenger jets, which use kerosene, a hydrocarbon fuel, for energy. A Type 1 transportation system is similar to what you've probably seen on Futurama or other depictions of futuristic worlds, a tube-based transportation system similar to the pneumatic tubes at bank drive throughs but different. The Type 1 global transportation system can go much, much faster. It's called an Evacuated Tube Maglev Transport, or ETT for short. Evacuated Tube Transportation Technology is actually a patented, readily engineerable technology which is ready to be implemented into our society with current, existing, off-the-shelf technologies. Maglev bullet trains are already in use in Europe and Asia. These trains go five to six hundred miles per hour and are only limited to going any faster by the air resistance and sharpness of the turns that they take. However, if you cover the track with a tube and suck out all the air, you get an evacuated tube with no air to cause resistance. The next trick is to get the capsule to levitate in the center of the tube. This can easily be achieved via the Meissner effect by which superconductors expel magnetic fields, causing them to levitate magnetically. The last, final step is to make ultra-straight guideways. Since we're bound by Newton's laws of motion, we have to take them into account. Force equals mass times acceleration, which means that we only feel a force when there is an acceleration that goes with it. Acceleration is just a change in velocity, so you can only really feel a force when there's a change in velocity. When you step on the gas pedal in your car, your velocity increases. This is why the gas pedal is sometimes called the accelerator. When you're traveling in a car going 70 miles per hour, do you feel any different than you do standing still, other than the vibrations from the tires on the road? What if you gently apply the brakes and lower your velocity? You may feel a tiny force. But if you slam on the brakes and lower your velocity very quickly, you'll feel a much bigger force. This is because there was a larger change in velocity, which equals a larger acceleration, which equals a larger force. You can't feel a velocity. You can only feel a change in velocity. So there's nothing preventing us from traveling 4,000 miles per hour as long as we don't change that velocity too quickly. In fact, Spaceship Earth is orbiting the Sun at tens of thousands of miles per hour right now, but due to the laws of relativity, we don't notice anything. 
Turning requires a change in velocity, which is known as centripetal acceleration. If we multiply this acceleration by a mass, we can get a force. The force of gravity is 1g of acceleration, and humans can endure 1 or 2 g's comfortably as long as the direction of acceleration doesn't change too rapidly up or down. Roller coasters reach as high as 5 or 6 g's, but not everyone enjoys riding them as much as some. So in order for passengers to ride comfortably on ETT, we need to place this constraint on the forces in our equations to tell us how large our turning radius needs to be based on our velocity. And as long as we make the tubes straight enough, we can go as fast as we want through them, traveling safely at thousands of miles per hour, faster than jets ever could. At such incredibly high speeds, we can also increase the frequency of traffic, which equates to an 80-lane superhighway fitting inside a single tube. The system would be completely automated, so there would be no backups or delays due to accidents or human driving error. Egg factories handle millions of eggs per day using automated machines, which break far less eggs than human workers would otherwise. Computer automation is what allows Homer Simpson to run the entire Springfield nuclear power plant from a single chair. Of course, he's just a cartoon character, but you get the idea. 40,000 people die each year from automobile accidents in America. That's 115 a day. Automated mass transportation systems not only save lives, but they completely eliminate stoplights and traffic jams. Imagine living in warm, sunny Los Angeles and commuting daily to New York City with only a 45-minute commute. Imagine ordering Chinese food from China. Imagine two-hour worldwide travel on demand at a fraction of the cost of an airline ticket. I can't even begin to list the benefits this type of transportation system would have on all aspects of human life and interaction, our economy, society, and world peace. Just think, an ETT backbone stretching across the U.S., up through Canada, Alaska, over the Bering Strait, down through China, across India, up through Europe, and finally to Britain. It would connect all the world's major population centers, free us of our addiction to hydrocarbon fuels, and could run completely on renewable solar and wind energy, built along the infrastructure of the track itself. Windmills could run vacuum pumps, while superconducting rails could transmit global electric power far more efficiently than high-tension wires. Evacuated tube transport is the transcontinental railroad of the future, and just like the one of the past, it will lead the world out of the current economic conditions by boldly creating unprecedented environmental, social, and economic returns. This will usher in a platinum age of global prosperity for generations to come. Zeitgeist Addendum mentioned the evacuated tube maglev system when they talked about Jack Fresco and the Venus Project. If we fail to make the step from type 0 to type 1, we will die. Not just us personally, but humans as a species will become extinct. The Internet is an important first step, but we have a long and difficult road ahead, just to ensure the survival of our species here on Earth, never mind get off this planet and begin colonizing space. Before I end this video, I'd like to take some time to critique Michiel Kaku's final comments about global government and the so-called terrorists. I have read Michel Kaku's books. I've also read old George Orwell's books, dozens of books on terrorism, 9-11, and globalization. So when I hear Professor Kaku talk about the need for a one-world government and who he thinks the terrorists really are, I can't help but wonder how much research he has really done on these issues. Has he read George Orwell's 1984, or Aldous Huxley's Brave New World? I'm pretty sure he's read that one. But if you want to talk about an accurate depiction of a futuristic world, you have to consider the good and the bad. Right now we're in a worse situation than Mr. Kaku recognizes, because he reads the newspaper to look for signs of the transition from Type 0 to Type 1. But if you live during an Orwellian transition, you can no longer trust that the information fed to you by your mainstream media is entirely accurate. An Orwellian transition is one that takes all of the information technologies and capabilities and tries to use them in order to create a Big Brother surveillance police state, a prison planet. Instead of the one world government being achieved through a peaceful unity of nations, it is taken by force. The first step is to control the information supply. The second step is to control the energy supply. And the third step is to control the monetary supply. Global domination is the name of the game, and it's not the New World Order. It's the old world order desperately trying to maintain control throughout the transition.